Hey, family, today's guest on our podcast is someone who I just met and who I have fallen so incredibly in love with as a person. Her name is Shuchi Sarkar, and I'm going to read her bio to you, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm so incredibly a fan of hers. Shuchi is a CMO for the biotech company Creo. But prior to that, she was a highly accomplished marketer with broad experience in different roles and numerous categories across many geographies that included companies like HP, Compaq, Motorola, and Ogilvy Advertising. As a matter of fact, prior to joining Creo, she was the global head of marketing for HP's digital printing business. And she's received so many industry awards that include the Effies, the Cannes Lions. She was innovative marketer by Economic Times and WIM Digital Marketer of the Year in 2017. You know, what the reason though, that I'm so excited about our conversation today with uh, with Chuchi, and I'm such a fan of hers, is because she gives a masterclass on understanding the values, opportunities, risks, and importance of branding. You're going to very quickly see why I'm an enthusiast to learn from her and to share her knowledge with you. So please enjoy this conversation with. Sushi Sakar. So, Sushi, I committed some really exciting conversation to our listeners who by now you know we refer to as our family. And one of the things I want them to understand is before we even get into this incredible career that I've described you have, who you were and how you got to here. Tell us about the little girl, Sushi. And I'll tell you why that's so important in this moment. So many people, not just women, but so many people are listening for your, from your journey to how they can establish theirs. I'd love you to just share how you grew up. Sure. Um, So, I was born in India, um, in, um, you know, actually born in Calcutta, which is very famous for the fact that Mother Teresa was there. But I moved to Delhi um, very quickly, uh, very young. So I have no memories of Calcutta really, except strangely, I ended up marrying a man who was from Calcutta. So my (laughs) family is all there, but uh, I moved to Delhi and um, I grew up there, went to school and, you know, uh, college, did my MBA. And, um, you know, surprisingly, not too many people know that, but I, my first job was actually in Citibank. So uh, I was like, you know, India was opening up as an economy then, and there were all these multinational banks coming in. And I thought, how fancy your first job, you're called an assistant manager and you get a huge paycheck. But I found banking very boring. And six months later, I moved to advertising. And I remember the guy who hired me said, either you're gonna leave advertising or you're gonna love it that you're gonna stay your entire life. Because he said, advertising one of those careers that you can't be neutral about, either you love it or you hate it. So I joined um, Ogilvy and um, worked there for about um, four and a half to five years, handling- You joined a top-notch firm of this time, Ogilvy. I mean, wow, you were really doing it, huh? Actually, it was a coincidence. I was wanting to leave Citibank and I went to a New Year's party and I met the head and we started talking and he said, oh, have you ever considered advertising? And that's when he told me his six month rule. And I said, no, I'll come and work with you. And I went there and I had this half an hour interview and he said, "Okay, you're in. And I was like, "Okay, I'm in. (laughs) <laughs> and I left Citibank, took a 50% pay cut in my salary as a freshman starter, went down to earning crumbs and traveling by public transportation again. But anyway, had the most fun time in advertising, learned so much, worked in different uh, categories. And then I was getting married and, you know, I was doing account management in advertising, which is the strategy and, you know, working with the clients. And I realized that if I wanted a happy marriage, advertising was not the place to be because most of them end up divorce courts and so I decided to leave advertising and more importantly I wanted to make the switch to marketing because you know advertising is honestly 
awesome, but it's still one part of marketing. And I wanted to do the whole mix. So I moved. And, and Shushi, it, it's important, I think, for you to make that distinction, especially since we have so many more tools that are available today for how we advertise and brand with the internet. Um, I think that it would be important for you to just really state from an academic perspective what the difference in advertising and marketing are, because a lot of people do love that together in their heads. And if they're young business owners, maybe they don't know how to get the right support. But importantly, I think if they're looking at this as a field, it may help them from your experience to know the difference. Sure. So advertising at that time was all about working in an agency and there were like three or four different kind of media, not like today where you have the internet and social. That time, all you could do was, you know, you had television and broadcast and you had print media and you had outdoor media and point of sale. Um, the thing about advertising is that you are there when you're in advertising, you're looking probably at just the communication part of a brand. You're looking at how to position the brand, how to talk about it and creating different content that takes your brand story out. And you're more in the creative aspect and the communication aspect. When you go to marketing, you make the shift to becoming a brand manager. So you're not only looking at the communication aspect, but you're looking at you know, the product and what you need to create in order to make a product, uh, what's the value proposition in order to create and make this product a true um, a success in the marketplace. You're working on, you know, not only just the communication aspect, but the pricing, the distribution, you know, the positioning, the messaging, and you actually in many companies also own the p &L. So, so the, so, so the app was, the advertising is really informing the customer, whereas the marketing on the broad scale informs the customer and it informs the company. Absolutely. And it's a bit broader because you're looking at things beyond just the communication aspect at distribution at pricing. As you know, there are five P's of marketing, right? Product, price, place, promotion. And then what people have added as fifth, which is either passion or people. So, yeah. um, so in when you're doing advertising, you're doing the fourth, which is promotion. But when you're doing marketing, you're doing the product, you're doing the pricing, you're doing the distribution, which is place, and you're doing the promotion. So, for example, um, you know the agencies uh, create the actual assets on how you you know communicate your story the actual advertising campaign and all of that I don't do that anymore in my job but I am involved in it because I give the brief I um, you know work with them to do the uh, choose the best creative choose the best positioning so my role now is more is one step removed from the creation process but it's larger in terms of what I cover yeah, and I think that's so wonderful for us to have that conversation right here up front because uh, for our family listening, so many of them are conscious not only of their branding if they're entrepreneurs or entrepreneurially inclined, <laughs> but as um, as employees in companies and executives in companies, they have to think about that as well, don't they? I mean, I don't think anybody escapes the value of understanding those P's that you speak to and the principles that uh, that govern them. Absolutely. I think that each one of these elements is so important uh, when you're building a business or you're building a brand or you're going to market, like it's not exclusive. I think, you know, building a, there is a product and there is a brand and people sometimes tend to confuse the same. They're not the same. A product is a physical, um, is a physical or a service or something like that. Whereas brand is all the values that you give to that product. You know, how do you, what are the, um, why uh, should a customer buy that product is what a brand defines. Your emotional connection with the product comes through the brand, the visual identity, the messaging, the colors, the packaging, all of those put together build the brand. You know, I was in a very interesting conversation on, um, I belong to the Forbes Council, and I was on a very interesting conversation just last week, which said, you know, should um, uh, design, uh, should uh, marketing 
be uh, should product marketing own um, is pro pro sorry is marketing or brand the same thing is product or brand the same thing that was the conversation and i was trying and you know um people tend to sometimes mistake the two and it's very important to understand that a brand has a much bigger life than outside the product. The product can change, the product evolves. Not that the brand doesn't. In fact, brands, if they don't evolve, they also die. And so it's very important for that evolution to happen. But a product is just a product. Why people buy it is because of the branding. You, the, the Coke is a product, but it's the brand Coke that makes it what it is. Otherwise, it's sugared water. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, I think that that applies to healthy companies that are building their brand. I think it deliberately applies to companies who had to pivot during uh, COVID and they went from even some, in some instances, one product to another, but they sold it under the same brand name. They earned the market respect under that name. And then I've also seen it happen when companies have to correct their product where they keep the same brand, but they have to correct the product. Uh, what comes handily to mind is uh, the video companies who were in the early days of TV and video, they didn't allow uh, a, 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 a minority or diverse musicians to appear on their, uh, on their networks. And then they quickly shifted from that and their whole product change to now you can hardly see anything but diverse companies, but they kept the brand name. They were able to evolve that brand. It had meant something and they did the cleanup behind and put the new product in front. So I think, I think your message applies in very different scenarios. It, it's still the same lesson. Yeah. I think that what is really important is for, for people to also understand that the, what the brand truth must match two things, the product truth and the customer truth. I always say that the strongest brands are built when the product truth and the customer truth come together. So you can't communicate something and build a brand if your product doesn't live up to it. You can't say that I'm uh, the most sustainable brand in the world and try and create an emotional connect with them unless your product actually delivers on that, right? Or for in any category, you know, I help you um, shampoos, you know, I'm the best cure for, uh, you know, giving you dandruff free hair if your product actually doesn't cure dandruff, right? It's, it's, it's like the product proposition must match that and it must match the customer insight. So if, you know- if That's the, where MTV had to make their correction. Correct. When they were delivering music video, music content to their audience and their audience started to seek that content through those channels that did deliver it, correct. they had to become more inclusive. As a matter of fact, I think Michael Jackson was their first lesson in that when they started to bring Michael's music into MTV. We've learned a lot since then, you know, but back then it was really important for them to understand the audience or the customer requirements of that time. Correct. And if your brand does not meet a customer need or a customer challenge, uh, you know, a real is not solving a customer's problem or, or mapping to a customer's need, then the product or brand will never succeed. Ultimately, consumers tend to buy products and brands that, and I'm using them interchangeably here, only just to make it clear that it's really important that both your product and your brand reflect the customer truth. What is it that you're trying to solve for the customer? Shushi, let, let me ask you two questions here because this is really a master class you're giving. And I, the word master class, the term gets thrown around so carelessly today. Uh, I, I, I even hesitated to say it, but in your instance, you really are the epitome of a master class when it comes to understanding branding and marketing. Here are the two questions I want to ask you. One is for our family, most of the people listening right now are as entrepreneurs working with much smaller companies with, with much smaller budgets around some really big 
opportunity. So we throw around brand names like MTV and Coke to them. They aren't in that league, but the principles still apply for them. Here are the two questions I have that can be so helpful. One is how do we take this understanding of branding and marketing and utilize it as a much smaller company to develop forward? And then the second question is around uh, when we have a brand identity, oftentimes the company can fail because it doesn't meet the truth. Sometimes a smaller company by not understanding question number one, may not get the accessibility to the market or the ability to represent their brand in a dynamic way. Um, whether that ends up being something that they have to identify differentiators versus I'm as good as, or whether it is truly just figuring out a way to be provocative without you know, uh, being offensive to get their uh, brand known. Uh, can you talk a little bit of, about that? Because we do have some very young entrepreneurs who are, uh, who are part of our family listening to you right now. Good. So I want to start off by saying that it's really important and it's a, you know, it's a very stereotypical answer that you'll hear from many marketers, but it is absolutely the truth. Brands are not built in a day. Brands are, you can launch products in a day and you can do everything else, but brands are built over time and they're built over time because they continue to invest in that um, not only in their messaging and in the emotional side of it, but you, you, you know that you identify or your brand positioning and your brand pillars, meaning, and let me explain what that means. The brand positioning means what do you stand for in the consumer's mind, okay? And when you start as, a, as an entrepreneur, and I'll give you the example of Creo here. When I started with Creo, it's a completely new startup and we are a cannabinoid um, ingredient manufacturer, which means that we are producing not weed and not CBD, but some of the other cannabinoids like CBG, et cetera, which people aren't even aware of anything beyond weed or CBD. So, you know, we are in a very nascent new emerging category. On top of that, we do not come from the plant we are we have a process of fermentation by which we are creating these cannabinoids so that you can scale them up and they're pure and they're more sustainably produced so when i joined the company we didn't even have a name so i had to name the company and then i had to design decide what the positioning was and the positioning like i said has to be relevant to your customer now as a b2b we sell to brands. So we'll be selling our products from the PNGs of the world to very small indie brands. And if you look at their customer, when PNG creates a product or a small indie brand like Drunken Elephant or you know anything in Sephora, what are their consumers looking for? The trend is what? People want products that are good for me or people want products that make me look good or address some problems, you know, skin problem, eye problem, whatever else, or brands that are much more sustainable. Plus, and over the counter. And over the counter and products. And, and they are looking every day. The consumer today is very fickle. Today he's with this or she's with this. Tomorrow she's with that, right? So we created a brand that is kind of tied up in our tagline, which says nature loves our cannabinoids and so will you, which is we are creating cannabinoids that are much more natural, uh, not more natural, but more sustainable and natural, but with a focus on our customer, which is this PNG or indie brand or whoever, in order to enable them to provide innovative products to their customers, so will you. That's the uh, enablement part of it. So the important thing when you're an entrepreneur is to first sit down and see and figure out who is the customer you want to sell your product to, okay? That customer, what, or a consumer, it could be a customer and in a B2B or it could be an end consumer, a millennial, you know, young girl, or it could be a IT manager, or it could be, a, um, you know, anybody uh, it is your important thing is first to sit down and understand who your customer is, 
what are they looking for? What motivates them? What are their challenges? What are their need gaps? Okay. Once you've understood that, then you see in your product, what is it that needs either the challenges or the need gaps? And when you do that, you create a positioning for your product. So maybe the challenge is uh, for uh, you as, a, um, um, you know, let's say you don't, you, as a consumer of say, uh, creating podcasts, your challenge today is you don't have something that's, uh, you know, cost effective, as well as gives you great quality and is easy for a non-tech person like you. Hypothetically, that's your challenge. Now, if I'm selling a solution to you and I create a piece of software that's maybe it's on a subscription model, so you don't have to pay thousands of dollars to me, you just pay some little money to me and it's very easy to operate so you don't need any technical support and it does great voice quality and great uh, video quality if you want that too, then I position it in that way to you. So one, then you decide the positioning. And, but that positioning, and I re-emphasize this because many people go wrong, it must, it must solve a problem or meet a need gap or suffice in motivation. And the motivation can be as something as it makes you look good. That's a human motivation. And is, if, you're, if you're not solving a problem, but you're tapping into human motivation that's important, that's great too. OK, um, you know, Apple is all about the simplicity of design and the ease of use. That is their positioning and everything they do around it is that. So once you've decided your positioning, it's very important that as an entrepreneur, as a startup brand, you do everything that re-emphasizes that main positioning and messaging. So if you're launching a product that is 100% sustainable, or it's very easy to use, or it's very innovative, or whatever your brand positioning be, make sure that whatever you do in the company at every stage has to re-emphasize and build that product. You will never see a product from Apple that is not beautiful design, that is not easy to use. <clears throat> the minute Apple is not able to you do that, they're going to break they're not going to have a brand that's going to live. And that's how brands die. When brands don't evolve and don't meet that positioning that resonates with the customer, that's when they die and become irrelevant. Okay. So as a small entrepreneur, it's not very difficult. Sit down, decide who do you want to market to? Secondly, what in your product is going to meet that need gap, that motivation or that channel? Then build out that brand positioning make sure that you have a differentiating factor in your brand positioning. Why this is unique of only you. Why can't 20 other competitors of yours claim that, okay? And sometimes, you know, the world of what we call unique selling propositions is dead. Many times today brands are becoming or products are becoming a commodity where, you know, you don't really have a differentiator either in your technology or whatever, then try and either create differentiators through you know, either services or through your distribution model or through something else. And if all else fails, then the best thing to do is to take a category, um, uh, category differentiator and appropriate it for yourself. Let me explain what that means. If everybody is looking for products that are the most small and, and cute and whatever, right? Everybody wants products that are light and sweet. Then if you can't find any other differentiator that differentiates you, take that category differentiator and just make it yours. Now that is not a strongest of strategy, but honestly, sometimes that's all you can do, which is to take a category differentiator and make it yours. But before that, try and see how you can actually create it. And then the other differentiator is your brand. So once you've decided this is your positioning or this is what you want to own, uh, then you manifest that in your brand through everything, your name. In a way, in a way Shushi, uh, and please remember your thought. I got to ask you this to make sure I'm following well. In a way, FUBU incorporated some of what you're saying. 
FUBU understood for us, by us was the differentiator. It wasn't necessary. Now they had great brand and they had great design, but they used the principle you're speaking with in saying, this is who we are. And this is the differentiator. It's made for us, by us. And they tagged it FUBU and it worked really well. Whether they had, had that excellent brand design or not, they still had a differentiator. And I think your lesson is so profound if people want to find something, because I think there's stuff online about FUBU from the academic perspective that teaches this, isn't it? Yeah, the biggest, ex the biggest example of this is Amazon. Don't think of Amazon where it is today, but remember Amazon when it launched, okay? What was Amazon's strategy when Jeff Bezos sat down? He said, today, customers want products speedily. They want them reliably, and they want them cheap, and they want variety. And so he created Amazon just on a delivery innovation, which is he got you your products through an online space rather than having to go physically, but he made it fast, and he made reliable, and he made it cheap and he provided you a great variety and, and then there are companies that deliver really excellent products because and um, i've heard that the products that your company and we got so much to talk about i really wanted to get into some other stuff with you but this is really a master class you're giving here now when we look at creo okay there's a promise in there that I think locks people very readily and locks corporations who wanna buy from you very readily. You say nature loves us and so will you. I heard you in the intent and the academic perspective of that. Let me tell you what I heard when you said that was a promise. It was a promise that I'd be able to readily identify your delivery to. That's brilliance. I don't know who in your company, unless it was you, who came up with that, but that is brilliant. Thank you very much first. So it was based, like I said, on this understanding that not our customer, not the PNGs and the indie brands, but their customers, the millennial who is going into Sephora to buy a product, is looking for a product that is natural and more sustainable, that is good for them and good for the earth. People today have moved from the time you and I bought products. Today, the brands that are making it big in this world are brands that are good for you, that have goodness. And the corporate social responsibility that comes along with that, whether that is uh, the shoes that say you buy a pair, we give a pair, or whether it's the company that says we replenish the earth and we plant trees, all of this matters, as well as you don't only not harm me, but you help me to stay healthy and get better. Correct. And, you know, there was a time, at least I know for myself, we used to go and buy products and we bought them, oh, because this packaging is beautiful. Oh, because, you know, its colors are so nice and stuff. But today- We bought a car because a pretty lady sat on it. <laughs> correct. But today when I see my daughter buying and she's 18, she wants to know what are the ingredients? What is good for her? Is this a fast fashion brand or is it a brand that is sustainable? Is it natural? What in this is good for her skin? She's not just buying on the outer beauty of the packaging or, you know, the car, car person sitting on the car, like I said. So, you know, buying behavior is changing. And so nature loves our cannabinoids were to tell these brands that if you buy our product, you can create products in turn, which are better, more, um, you know, benefit oriented and more this thing. And so will you was because we wanted to bring in the fact that whatever we do, and we are a B2B, we are not selling to a consumer, we are selling to another brand, right? So we are not selling on the Sephora shelf, we are selling to somebody who will put their product on the Sephora shelf. So. So Will You was an effort for us to make sure that the focus comes back on our customers, that we are not about just selling you our products, but we are going to enable you to create products that will help you succeed in the market. And I think, as I was saying, you know, before, once you've got this positioning done and you've worked it out, then 
you need to make sure everything, whether it's your name, your visual identity, the messaging that you create, whether it's a video you create, your website, a social post, anything, all of that must reflect your positioning and your messaging. And that's how you create a strong brand over time. We are still very early in our, in our journey on Creo. We've just launched the brand. We're starting to take it. For it to become a strong brand, I'm very sure will take a couple of years. But today in the world of social, brands can be built faster. We didn't have that when I started my career. Today, you know, the LinkedIn's and the Facebook's and the Google and everything else has made brand creation much faster. But by the same tokens, brands die faster too. So it's mm. really important to create yourself relevant because the consumer is so fickle and has so much information on their hands that you have to constantly keep yourself relevant and all the more important to create that emotional connection with the thing because people buy brands that they, that they relate to, not brands that they feel, oh, this is not for me. So that emotional connection is very important. And you know, many times companies, product managers, product marketing guys, or even marketers or sales or whoever else it is, we always undermine that. Marketing today has moved to becoming a lot about data. That's what you will hear, right? All the time, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data, you know, having HubSpots and other marketing automation, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is very important. And data has really revolutionized marketing. I'll just complete my thought for one second. So data is completely important, but one should never forget that a brand and marketing is beyond just data too. It's what you say, how you say it, where you say it is equally important to the data aspect. Sorry. No, it's brilliant you said that because it actually segues to the question I, I, I had in mind, and that is so many questions to ask you. Uh, Shuti, when we see these influencers, how did that evolve to be a whole uh, career choice for some, number one? Uh, importantly, how does an entrepreneurial sized company advantage from that or are they better to stay away from that? That's a lot of question in there. Now, uh, absolutely. I, the influencers came up because with so much information happening and so many brands in the marketplace, st they started becoming suspicion on you know, what the manufacturer was saying. So the manufacturer and their website and their social content and this and that is still important, but people started relying on peers. So a big influencer could be your peer. So if somebody you know has bought something, you're likely to buy it if they recommend it. But most importantly, people started following certain people who, who became experts, but they were neutral. So they did not represent a certain brand. They were neutral experts on something. And they started you know, creating content that was very engaging. Their personalities were engaging. People started following them. And so they became like a reference point to, um, uh, to oh, many oh, other- Oh, 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 uh, maybe some of our family aren't uh, gonna relate to this as much as some others, but what you're describing, in a way, Oprah used to do that back in the days when she had her TV show in the middle of the day. And whenever she recommended something as a neutral consumer, it couldn't stay on the shelves fast enough. That kind of that kind of uh, of, uh, of reference or or, or or recognition moved into the Internet, huh? Yes. And, and you had the YouTubers and whatever who became these Instagrammers, who became these big personalities. For them, it's very attractive. At 18 years, if you're earning $3 million, you know, wow. And it became very aspirational. And, you know, 
content became so easy to produce with every tool at our hand. And that is what has led to further growth in these influencers because it's so easy for me to pick up my iPhone and go around, you know, taking a picture or a video and putting something on it, editing it and putting it out there, right? You didn't have that when you and I were growing up, right? <laughs> no, so, no. So creating content, you know, there's a democratization of creating content, but now there is so much content out there that customers have started filtering what content they like and what they don't. And that is why influencers have become more important because people have chosen to follow their content. In the filtering process, they have won and they have said, okay, I'm going to be a person who's going to actually, uh, this is the person I follow. And I remember, you know, five, seven years back, I wanted my daughter to buy some linen uh, for her bed. And I remember she came back and said, you know, she wanted to buy some product from a particular um, YouTuber, which I had never heard of. But she said, mom, I follow her and she's really good. And she recommends only products that are good for you. And I'm telling you, it was triple the price that I had to pay in a store. But my yeah insisted on buying this and I, that's the day I realized the power of these influencers you know I never heard of it but my daughter follows all these people on YouTube and she loved what uh, this woman was doing and because she has the right values and you know whatever it was something that we ended up um, uh, buying so for a small company I would say if you have small budgets and the quickest, easiest way to get the word out is to associate yourself with the right influencers. Somebody who is believable, who is credible, and who will take your product story forward. But it has to be authentic. You know, people must believe because otherwise the influencer will lose out as well. And that is why these influencers are very particular about which brands they support and the stories they tell because their personal credibility is dependent on that. So it's a mutual thing. They have, in order to maintain their followers, they have to give the right kind of content. And you as a brand also want to get associated with somebody who is authentic so that people don't think this is a sales pitch, but this is something that is authentic. So my advice to all your young entrepreneurs, produce creating brands and wanting to sell products um, because that's equally important. Remember, creating the brand is equally important as much as it is selling your product. If you don't sell, there's no money to create the brand. So both of them are equally important things that you have to do as marketers, build the brand and sell the product because without doing the second, the first is not going to happen. And they're not mutually exclusive, but sometimes they require different messaging and different tactics. That's why I'm saying what we call traditionally as demand generation versus brand building in any big organization are two different functions many times, but it is important as an entrepreneur to know that you need to do both. Prioritize what is important at what stage of your growth journey. And remember they're not mutually exclusive, but they are slightly different in terms of the tactics and in terms of the messaging, okay? And so to my advice is make sure that you understand what your goals are short term, mid term and long term. And from there, it's very easy once you've defined your go to market strategy and you have your product and you have your um, story and your messaging together, you know, make sure you communicate it in a manner that is engaging and relevant also through the right content and influencers can definitely be a part of it. One thing I think that most of our family are aware of, but it can bear some repeating in the context of a lesson from you, is how critical it is to understand that once you do engage online presence, that um, it is very yielding, but it can be also very unforgiving. You don't get to undo a lot without a real effort. Um, I know you and I both value the work we do with a man named Nathan Pettijohn at Corduroy and, um, and, 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 and the attention that he gives to making sure startups are able to deliver to, uh, to, 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 um, 
a social media platform, but the message is really important on a larger part for many of our family, whether it's their personal brand they're giving presence to or their company, that they understand that social media can yield a lot, but it can be unforgiving as well. You make a mistake in a bigger way. I think they get that conceptually, but can you talk about that a little bit to help us understand why it's so important not to take the risk of faulty presence? Yeah, so, and that's a great point because when you choose your influencer also, make sure you choose somebody who's not too controversial and may tomorrow end up giving you bad press, right? It's really critical to do that. Uh, do you want me to just switch off my phone for a sec? Absolutely, because while you're doing that, um, I can make sure that our family is aware that the whole opportunity to have you present today was such a thrill with your busy uh, work. And we're going to talk a little bit about, please turn it off if you need to go turn it off. Uh, mm -hmm. Just go go ahead and turn it off, okay? Oh, okay, but just the opportunity of having you here, uh, Shuchi, they've got to be aware of how busy you are. We're gonna talk a little bit about the transition you made from corporate to a smaller company, because that's a lesson too. But if you can just talk about how big your mistakes can be and the importance, if you can take that a little bit yeah. first. So, um, you know, um, in, in the past years, when media was not as prevalent and so easy to send information here and there, the world was a bit more forgiving. If you ended up having a brand ambassador and the brand ambassador, say, went and had a marital affair or got involved in some other thing, you could, you know, disassociate with your brand and over time things would die off. But today the world is viral. One mistake and one person will share it and share it and share it. And soon you know, the little small thing which may have started in an island in Tahiti will go all over the world, okay? So the first is just the sheer power of sharing information online that makes, it, makes the problem much larger than what it is. Secondly, because of um, so many people out there being able to ex express their opinion, so many influencers, so many people who carry weight in this world and people as ordinary citizens being able to express their opinion, it's very easy for people to start judging. And to be honest, as human beings, we love judging. We don't really look into ourselves and say, you know, who are we and what we do, but people are very easy to judge others. And in the internet, in a very open forum, through all these social things, People are constantly judging you. So a mistake made once because the number of people who comment on it, because they share and reshare and all that, it becomes much larger. And generally in the world today, because there are so many brands and so much information, people are very unforgiving and unforgiving. You know, in previous times you had limited choices and you had limited access to information and whatever else. So people in turn were more accommodating, more forgiving at the end of the day, if you didn't like a GM brand or a Ford brand or this or that car, ultimately everybody didn't come to know the intricacies and what were your choices anyway, right? So now because of this and the content never dies, one very important thing to understand is that Google never lets anything die. The minute you search, <laughs> you will get it, right? So when nothing ever dies, it's always out there for people to quickly search and look up. Then there is all these reviews and people, you know, sharing their opinions on this and that. And to be, and to, to be honest, People listen to it. You go to a Yelp review before you choose a restaurant or you check out an Amazon review or a Google review. And those, if those have become negative, I don't want to try it out. I don't want to do it. So it be, even one small negative review of a product or a brand or a restaurant can kill it because then 10 people say, oh my God, you know, do I really want to go there? And so the content never dies. It's easily available. So many people passing information on it. And then I think the moral code in the world. So let me not say moral code. Um, I think people's expectations have changed. 
Um, people are much more stringent about what they expect. And there's a general level of intolerance that at some stage have set in amongst all of us. It's maybe because of the environment, because of various things we've gone through, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, having said that, it's people are holding people and things and all that to very exacting standards. And therefore, one mistake can and especially this new millennial generation, which I think is actually very responsible in many ways. They're much more bothered about the world and equity and not bo doing body shaming and this and that. My daughter is, or even her friends or people around that, I see there's so, many, so much bothered about issues that frankly at 18, I was clueless about. Mm -hmm. And so they're more exacting the more unforgiving, there's less tolerance in the world. We have become more insular as societies. At one side, the world is going global, but at the other side, we are becoming much more insular about protecting you know, our own identities and countries and religions and communities. So all of that combined together makes it very, very important that as, especially as a startup brand, that you be very realistic, authentic in the way that you communicate, don't over exaggerate, you know, make sure that you are able to fulfill what you promise. Because if your promise and your product, and that's why I said, huh, every brand must ultimately come from the product truth. If your promise doesn't live up to it, or you choose a wrong influencer, or you commit something else, unless you're a brand that has been around for years and years and years, customers are not going to be so forgiving. You know, you 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 hit a lot there, uh, Shuchi. We've got to really, at some point, just sit down and redesign this conversation into a classroom because it's just awesome. I want to ask you this. You know, we're uh, many of us are catching uh, midnight views of the Olympics, uh, regardless of where we live, um, and one of the things you said really hit me when you said. Um, many of the millennials and younger, because millennials are up there now too. Many of the next gens are, uh, yes, are, are, are yeah, are pay, paying attention to things differently than people of my generation and before D. Case in point, people bought cars based on pretty women sitting on them today, sometimes with a cigarette in their hands. Now that would be a turnoff and it would be about, <laughs> you know, a whole different thing. And they're more interested in how quickly does it switch from gas to electric or battery. Um, but one of the things I've seen on the Olympics that's really been exciting is when those young competitors from different countries, once they establish who got gold, silver, or bronze, they all, in many instances, hug each other up and celebrate each other or I've seen on a couple of instances, hug each other up because somebody didn't deliver it as they were planned or expected to. Is that something that we're seeing in how people are different in their whole perspective about brand competition as well? Um, so I would say sportsmanship has been around all the time. The fact that you cheer your competitor or give them a hug or, you know, cheer up somebody who didn't meet the standard, what they were wanting to aim for or cheering on the losing team or the winning team has it's been around forever. In fact, um, um, I, I've seen it in all. What has happened now is our eyes. Today, because of the way the content is produced and the way those stories are told, and the people who tell those stories have made us more conscious about it. Because there are so many people writing about it and talking about it and trying to get the human angle of everything is why you and I notice it much more. 
But do you awesome. think your, you or your father's generation or mother's generation or anything else, we were less sportsmanlike? No. Did we not cheer our competitors? We did, absolutely. Did you not comfort a friend who lost out? You did. But I think it's the emotional angle has become so much now. You know, we never recognized emotional quotient in marketing, what is called EQ, till maybe 12, 14 years back, right? But it is so intangible. And the way that the content is being produced today, people want the human stories. It's the, you know, I'll give you a completely off base conversation here, but I think there's a lesson in it. So, you know, I was, um, I'm consulting with this company, um, which provides, um, and it's voluntary work that I'm doing for, an, for a nonprofit that is actually amazing. They bring communities together with paralegals of that community to actually fight social justice issues. So it could be in the area of citizenship rights or health or climate or whatever. Okay. And they want to create a movement. And they were asking me, how do you create a movement? And I said, you know, some movements today are very organic in the society, whether it's the Me Too or it's women's, um, you know, equality in jobs and pay, or it's about protecting our climate because at some core level, they're very intrinsic to us, right? That's because they've been heightened by media and they are organic. They happen because of everything that is being said around us today. And that is the reason why you notice that thing about the Olympics, you know, um, and I'm forgetting her name. I don't know if you remember, but there's this, uh, the Olympics uh, person who did not, um, you know, compete for the US in the end. Um, mm -hmm. Gymnast, mm -hmm. right? I forget her name, I'm sorry. But mm -hmm. I was reading a piece, you know, me and my daughter were sitting that day in the, and my husband and we were talking about how everybody is really admiring what she did. You know, she didn't, you know, she had the, the strength of character to bow out and, you know, people were admiring her for what she did and what she stood for. And then yesterday I read a piece in LA uh, Times that said, you know, she absolutely succeeded as a human being and as a woman, but she failed as a gymnast. And it's very important that we acknowledge that she failed as a gymnast. And I sent that article to my husband and daughter to say we were just talking about a day, day before. And yes, what she did was very admirous. But in a way... Simone Biles. What, Simone Biles. Yes, Simone Biles. Exactly. Uh -huh. but, but LA Times point of view, this author who wrote it, was that as a gymnast, purely as a sports person excelling at her profession, she failed because she didn't have the mental aptitude to go and compete, right? That's a different perspective to- Well, also, also, and, 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 and I think you're onto something I want you to explore more here. Also, um, Shuji, I've heard conversations as well on another kind of failure too. Um, if she was aware, and she well may not have been because we don't know the full story yet, but if she was aware she was having these difficulties and they did not occur in an abrupt way once in Tokyo, did she eliminate someone else's chance to compete by going with the doubt of her ability to compete, not to win, but to compete. And I've heard conversations about that too. Who didn't get that spot, you know? Yeah. Um, so so I hear what you're saying that there are, 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 are different perspectives considered. Please continue. Now, I was just saying, so the reason why this has become such a big thing now, it's not as if instances like this have not happened in the past. They have. But today, because of the channels and the media available to us, look at the amount of conversations we are having and the amount of different perspectives that we can discover around the same problem. If you were sitting in the olden times, you'd probably read the, you know, listen to ESPN or read your Sports Illustrated and get like one particular thing. But today, you listen because of what is around us. There is so much conversation around this topic and so many different points of view. Now, 
you may agree with one or disagree with one that's your own personal outlook okay but the fact is that today the for anything the journey is so different whether you're a gymnast or you're a brand because people are consuming content judging sharing talking so it was to your earlier point that i was just telling you the story and the fact that you know when somebody asked me how do i create a movement i said creating a movement is very easy but it can go this way or that way and you need to actually map into something that's more organic and yeah, just i think there's so that, much there yeah there's so much there uh shuji and i remember years ago this is back when we still read newspapers doing this right <laughs> and um turning page to page and i remember that uh gentleman told me you know you travel a lot and we used to take those flights that had connections to them you didn't have as many direct flights back in the day and he said what i want you to do I want you to buy newspapers that are uh, diverse in their audience. He wasn't using diversity the way we are now. This is before we had the uh, uh, phraseology and terminology around D, E, and I. But he was saying you got right wing and you got left wing. That's how they referred to it. And you got to read them both to find where your truth is in the middle. And it leads me to another question that I have to ask you before I move to that bigger one. And that is just like we're talking about branding and marketing and it being internal to external, how we inform ourselves, even as we're building our brand or our product has to also have similar considerations where we gain our information from. If we're always getting our information from one source, then we may not be getting the complete information. And that's when you had the conversation about uh, Simone Biles, a success as a human, was she a success as a gymnast come up? So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And then I promise I'll move this conversation forward, but you are teaching so much in my neck of the woods, we would say, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I agree, you know, um, when I joined advertising, the same boss who told me you either love it or hate it told me, when you go home, I want you to keep your television on because whether you're doing some other work or whatever, doesn't matter because when you see content, you see ads, you see what is happening. When you go to a retail store, make sure you visit a lot of retail stores, you know, because that's where you recognize what is working today. What are people liking? What are they not liking? What is in? What is out? And in advertising, that is so important to know because unless and until you're going with the trend and you're going with what is there, you're never going to succeed. So, you know, go into a store, see what products people are liking, what packaging is attracting their mind, listen to the TV and see which ads are, you know, coming on more often. What are people saying about it? See what the news is saying, you know, who are the biggest celebrity makers today? And that was our only way of getting information, right? But today that's not there. You can listen to a podcast, you can go to a webinar, you can, you know, see a video, you can go to YouTube, you can listen to a newspaper, you can listen to the Fox News, or you can listen to CNN. I mean, so many different perspectives. How do you actually decide what you want to do and what you don't? And that comes to what I said, is that whole filtration process. You go through a lot, and then you narrow it and narrow it and narrow it and narrow it and say, okay, this these sets of things give me diverse set of opinions, yet I find them interesting. They're not ridiculous, which I don't want to go after because some of the channels I may find too ridiculous or too extreme right or too extreme left or whatever. These are the people who are authentic in what they say. So I want to follow them. This is what I find interesting from a work perspective. So marketing people that I follow because marketing is changing every day today. So if I don't listen to what is relevant about my business, I will die out. So I need to listen to these marketing people. These are the people I get my daily news from. This is where I get my travel news from. This is where I get whatever. And you come, you, you go to a vast majority and then you, you know, kind of narrow it down to the people. And and, you know, hopefully you've self-selected for yourself things that make sense for you and provide you information the way you seek it. 
Now, I may seek information which is much more authentic and genuine, but somebody else may be seeking information that is much more controversial or much more um, out there, right? And they will follow those kind of people. That is why every kind of content producer is surviving in this world. Because there are people who choose the out there. There are people like me who choose more authentic, understated, more rational views. There's some who want very conservative, some who you want more liberal. You know, some people who are wanting to fly, uh, follow fly fishing and somebody who wants to fly and travel and somebody whatever. So you self-select. It's a bit like when yeah. you raise your kids, right? You expose them to everything under the earth. Try music, try dance, try drama, try sports, this, that, etc. And then by the time they're in middle school, they'll say, okay, mom, I love your ideas for me, but this is what I want to do, right? So it's a bit like that. You self-select. Wow. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Listen, I'm going to shift a little bit, but I don't want to. I still have so many questions to ask you. I just love, love, love you. Um, Shuti, you left pretty big company with pretty big job to go to a startup. Before we even talk about the startup and the amazing work you're doing there that we've alluded to a little bit already, Let's talk about the mindset and the criteria considerations you gave to actually making that that shift that, by the way, I'm sure had to be informed by your family as well as your own career goals. Yeah. So it's a bit of a personal story. Um, you know, I had a child pretty late in my life and me and my husband both did very big careers. And so, you know, initially in my life, I told my husband, you know, you do the big jobs. And I, you know, chose jobs that didn't require me to get up five in the morning or travel for 20 days a week, whatever, whatever. And, you know, he went and he built his career and, and whatever else. And I stuck, and I wouldn't say stuck because I really enjoyed my time uh, with HP across continents and many different categories. I worked from PCs to enterprise, to print, to digital print, to everything in Europe, in Asia, in India, in um, the US doing all kinds of roles. But one of the reasons that I did continue to stay was the sheer personal flexibility of what HP offered me. You know, after you've kind of become established in a company, you know, I had a bit of flexibility and working from home or, you know, if my daughter had a concert and I had a meeting, I could say to my boss, hey, listen, but I need to go to my daughter's concert. You know, can I dunk this uh, travel or change it or send someone else? And I, for me, that was very important. And then I was getting to a stage of life where, you know, my fall this year, my daughter goes to college. And so about two, two and a half years back, I was like, oh, my God. And I'm a very planned person. I always think a, a little bit ahead. Um, you know, uh, sometimes that gets me into a lot of trouble because I'm so much about you know, planning and thinking ahead. Like people, people who don't like planned holidays would hate to go on a holiday with me because I plan out literally every hour and which restaurant I want to eat and where I want to go. But anyway, um, you know, I, I, she might, I was like, what am I going to do as an empty nester? And I decided that the time had come. And because my husband had started his own business and, you know, he said, hey, you go now for the big traveling jobs or whatever, I'm around for Anusha, our daughter. And so I was like, okay, that's great. Now I have that one thing removed and my child is going away. What am I going to do as an empty nester? And I decided, you know what? I'd had enough of tech and I don't <laughs> want to do another job in tech. I want to do something in a different category. And so as I looked around, you know, there were many categories I considered, to be honest, it wasn't just biotech and, you know, whatever I looked at, um, should I go back to CPG, um, you know, should I go into health and pharma, uh, whatever. So I looked at different categories and I made a list of, okay, you know, I want to go into either a subscription-based business or biotech or this or that. And then as I started talking to people and uh, I found that I had got stereotyped. I was a tech person and I came from a big company and that is all that people wanted me to talk about. I mean, they, 
I had one executive recruiter, head of a very big executive firm, and said, you are in a pipe dream if you think you're going to get a job in a smaller company or a startup or a different category. You've spent 20 years in HP. You come from a legacy company. And um, you know that's your future. Go to Microsoft or Intel or something else, and that's what you want, you have to do. And I was like, okay, maybe you know, have I made a wrong assessment? But anyway, so it show, it was sheer coincidence that I was actually at meeting a friend for lunch, and I was telling him this big dilemma I'm in, and you know, all I keep getting is this, and you know, but I really want to go to a smaller company. I want to become a CMO. That's my dream, and I want to go to a different category. And just coincidence that he told me that he had these two friends from Cambridge. One of them, this is his third startup. He sold the first took the second one is public, they're in biotech, do you want to talk to them? Okay, when I spoke to them, to be honest, the company was much smaller than I'd ever thought of. I never wanted to go for a startup that was as small as this, but I loved the founders. Uh, I loved their vision. Um, I had immediate kind of, you know, um, let's chemistry as in a professional chemistry with them. And I just felt that, okay, here they were willing to take a chance on somebody like me who came from a large company who had no idea of their category. And we just felt that we were right for each other. And so, um, you know, and I know it was a bit of a financial, this thing, but, you know, when you join a startup, you're obviously looking at the exit, not having saved any money uh, my entire life. The exit is probably my, I tell my founder <laughs> every day, you know, my, my retirement is dependent on what you do. So um, I decided that, okay, this was it. I'm going to make this change. Um, and it was, and I told him in my interview that for me, joining Creo was a personal mission. I wanted to prove to all the naysayers of that you could come from a large legacy tech company and succeed in a completely small company with no resources and a completely different category just because you understood your subject, you understood your marketing, you understood your customers, you had the discipline of thinking, you understood how to build something from scratch and you could succeed. And in a way, this is a personal mission for me. I wanna succeed because I wanna to show to the world that this transition is possible. And I had to relearn skills, wow. it was not easy. I, I had to do things which I probably had done 20 years back in my career. And in seven in the morning, I was actually writing strategy and vision and org culture. And then at 8.30, I was sitting and doing some ex very tactical job that I, I had to not done for 20 years of my life. And I had to call up on friends and people who had worked for me and say, teach me how do we actually set up a LinkedIn campaign? I'd never done it. I had people doing it for me, right? So- Wow. It was a transition, but I have to say everything that I learned in HP helped me so much. And I sometimes do miss the people, the power, the uh, money that went with such a big job in terms of budgets and things like that, that I had to spend. You know, when you're small, nobody really wants to give you the time of the day. You're trying to figure out everything. So I had to go back into my personal network to get things done and, you know, leverage all the credibility I'd built up to really uh, do things, but it's been a fantastic journey. I mean, um, I've loved learning a new category, working in a small team. It was a completely white paper. I decided the name, the identity, the positioning, everything along with, you know, my co-founders and a couple of the other executive teams. So I didn't inherit a legacy. I am now creating a legacy that tomorrow somebody else will inherit. And for me, wow. that's really wow. great. Wow. Shushi, um, you know, first of all, you've mentioned twice these angels uh, moments that have happened. Your first big job, you happen to meet someone at an event that you hadn't really planned to go to. And then very similar circumstance with your current co-founders. I think there are no accidents in that. I think you really prepare yourself in each instance to grow to the next level and 
here's the thing. You're also pioneering in a way because there is the perspective and the reality in many instances that uh, women aren't getting those opportunities. And that especially we don't get those opportunities when we are going into new areas or in, in, in doing things in new ways. Uh, let alone when we're competing from traditional, you know, strengths. And so you're really changing the dynamics for women in business as well, in how you're doing this in so many ways, uh, being a founder and bringing your own expertise and your respect to that, even without having had the experience to that. Also, um, in how you're having your voice uh, heard and how you're promoting for good. I mean, you're just doing so much. Where are the lessons in that for other women, whether they be corporate, whether they be university students or people just rethinking their career? Uh, where are your lessons? What are your key lessons in that for folks? Sure, lots of- And by lessons. the way, don't limit it to women. I just happen to think you're an incredible woman and I don't know how you're seeing the business environment for women today. No, I completely agree. Um, to be honest, um, but I have to clarify, I'm not a founder of Creo. I'm, I'm one of the first employees of Creo, uh, but the, the two co-founders who started- Yes. But uh, for me, um, to be honest, I feel like um, for women today, it's a much better world. You know, people are conscious of the fact that we need diversity. We need different women. We need strong women. Um, you know, there was a time, um, Janice, that, and that's true of most women executives. I think at least in my opinion, 60 to 70% of the women executive I meet at some point of their time in their career have been given feedback, oh, you're too aggressive, you're too assertive or whatever, because the same thing that you expect and hear from a man, when a woman says it, oh, you become too aggressive. And people, people are so used to their normal way of judging a woman as, you know, the soft, pliable, you know, whatever traditional roles we associate with women in our head, that we are unable to take a boss who is a woman, yet she has her own opinion, she's strong, or you immediately gets to, you're too aggressive, you're too close-minded, you're this, you're that. But intricately, women have a nurturing within them, you know, um, and I think because of that nurturing capabilities, we actually are much more empathetic leaders. And that's what world wants. And because we're constantly multitasking and we look at things in a slightly different way, we bring a different perspective to the table. My advice from anybody based on my own career, and I have to say I was very lucky. I got some incredible bosses, some incredible leaders, and some really strong people who supported me in my own journey professionally, as well as my husband and my family, who always encouraged me to fly my wings and try different things and people who gave me these opportunities. So I was lucky and everybody doesn't get those. It doesn't make them less of who they are. It's just that I was very lucky. So I do offer three or four pieces of advice. Number one, be very sure about what is it that you want for yourself? And the minute that you do that and it comes from the heart and you're not trying to fix a stereotype and you're not trying to um, go after, oh, it's just the next step on the corporate ladder, but you actually say what you really want to see yourself in. And it could be that you want to be a CEO or a CMO or whatever else it is. Um, but as long as you know that, then work with yourself, with your you know, your partners, people in the organization, your mentor, whoever, to actually jump in order to get there. What do you need to do? What are the steps you need to take? You know, and, and then try and work on getting those opportunities, whether they're through networking, whether they're within your organization, whether they're external, whether it's leveraging, whatever. And I think, and having that vision of where you want to be and that vision can change to what I thought I wanted to be 20 years back is very different from 10 years is very different from now because you change 
I never thought I wanted to be a CMO till I met um, a um, till I met a person who was the CMO of HP and became an informal mentor to me called Antonio Lucio, then became the Facebook CMO and is now involved in huge thing to do with women's diversity. And he told me, you know, you should aspire to be a CMO. And I was like, really, I can be a CMO? And it's the first time that somebody opened my eyes to that. And so what I wanted 10 years back, you would, if I had told you I want to be a CMO, no, I didn't even think about it. I felt, oh, if I can run marketing functions somewhere, somewhere, that'll be good enough for me of a thing. Wow. And what I'm saying is that those things change and work on you. And I had a, another boss called Sajiv who brought me to the US, actually offered me a long time back the opportunity to come here. And I said, no, my daughter's too small. I don't want to come to a place where I have to do everything and I don't want to do it. Eventually, I did come to the US. But when he offered me and he showed me all that I could do, I said, no. And then another four years later, he asked me again, are you sure you don't want to come? And I said, yeah, yeah, now I want to come because I, mm -hmm. my personal circumstances had changed, right? So you change what you want, but at every stage, know where you want to be immediate and at least for the next three to five years, then it's easier to plan and don't wait for anybody to come and present things to you. Oh, my boss is going to give me a career path and plan. It doesn't happen anymore. Seize your own opportunities. Network inside the company, outside the company, with women's organizations, whatever it is. And, and learn to understand that you are going to face frustrations. You're going to face rejection if you're going to place yourself out there. You know, I remember I got so frustrated, the fact that everything is a boys club in Silicon Valley. And it is true. Men go have a cigarette together. They go have a drink together. They have make the same kind of jokes. When I came to the United States, I remember my first meeting and they were discussing college foot uh, basketball and I had no idea. I never studied here. I had no college here. I didn't understand what college basketball meant. And I felt so out of place in that first meeting. It was totally different. My humor is different. My accent is different. So, you know, all those things you acknowledge and know that they are going to be at some points impediments, but don't get frustrated and learn to understand that, you know, everything you want won't come, but you have to move on, have a thick skin and make your own identity. Don't always try and fit in. Oh, I have to learn basketball. No, I st made stories about, you know, how I hated the DIY culture in the US. And I would talk to people about how I didn't know when I came to the US to switch on a, you know, um, even a washer dryer or a machine because I'd never done work like this in my entire life in India or Singapore always had helpers. So I would laugh at myself and it became a big joke. And that is what made me create the bonding with my colleagues, not college basketball, because I would laugh at myself and my old stories and how I was a totally pampered, you know, spoiled brat who had never done this work. But that laughter created bonding with my colleagues. So make your own brand, make your own mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. Don't try and fit in. Be who you are and be proud of that. If somebody says you're aggressive, okay, change tonality if to match what works best and take feedback. First of all, never be defensive about feedback, which I've honestly had to learn. I would take feedback very personally and get very offended if somebody said something, but I realize now that you have to take feedback in order to become better. And so, you know, take feedback, learn how to do that, but also know that you will never be liked by every single human being in this world, that every single opportunity will never materialize. Some will and some won't. And what works out for you is probably the best for you. But create those opportunities, network, understand that this is a boys club and you're breaking into it. I remember I wrote to one recruiter who, you know, does a lot of recruitment for um, women. And I wrote to her in frustration because I was getting so bogged down by how can I break from a hardware company into something different. And, you know, I wanted different kind of opportunities, but people would forget what I, all my background, but would just judge me by the 20 years in HP in hardware. And so I wrote to her and said, I'm asking your help to help me break this boys club and to understand that I'm not just what you read as a line on my resume, but I come with experiences which could actually help companies.
right? And so take initiative, do that. It was, you know, I never knew she would respond or not. She responded. <laughs> and through her, I got an interview. I never ultimately took that job because they wanted different skill sets than mine. But the fact is that, you know, it brought me forward. Shuji, this is so incredible. I, I don't want to leave, again, I don't want to leave this topic. I got to shift gears. We are all seeing the variants and the different rules and regulations, the different protocols be, and approaches, perspectives on COVID. Um, you still have strong connections back home. How are you seeing COVID and what are your lessons to us in this season right now, just as a human being around how we're treating this? It's had an impact on your family, yes? Oh my God, it's been a devastating year. I have lost so many family and friends back home, even in the US, uh, but definitely back home at one point of time. Um, I remember I had almost lost, I knew one step removed. So a friend's parent or somebody's sibling or somebody who worked in HP or something else. I knew 200 people who had died in two months when the COVID you knew 200 people yeah just one within remote. two months who passed away due to COVID yeah. one and one step removed it's not a friend's friend's friend this is a friend's parent somebody's sibling somebody who worked in HP somebody who worked in HP's their uh, wife or you know something else and this was apart from the 20 30 people who I know who'd passed away earlier this was just in two months I have written more um, you know, message, condolence messages in two months than I've written in my entire life. And it was heartbreaking. I lost family. I lost two of my mom's brothers. One of my cousins was just 52 years old. My husband lost his uncle. We lost so many close friends, dear friends who will never be replaced in our lives. We left, lost friends, parents who we grew up with. So there was an emotional connection with them. It was devastating. And through that, you know, to power on. And for me, I haven't seen my parents for two years. My, my dad is devastated that he couldn't come for my daughter's graduation or college going. I mean, you know, I used to always hope and pray that my parents should be there when my daughter graduates and when she goes to college. But in spite of being there, they couldn't come. They had to watch it virtually. Luckily, Pally gave a link, her school, and, and she could watch it. They could watch it, but it was terrible, heartbreaking. I haven't seen them for two years. And so, and I don't have in-laws, I just have my parents, but still I haven't seen siblings, you know, whatever. It's so lonely and it's heartbreaking and it's terrible. And to me, the frustration is in spite of all that has happened and the devastation, people still don't want to take the vaccine. People still don't want to be careful. Things become better and everybody drops everything. No mask, no nothing, let's get together in crowds. And I think that's terrible because for somebody who has faced as much personal devastation as me, when I see this, it just angers me. Like in, in places like Indonesia and Cambodia and India, people died because there were no vaccines for them to take. But in a place like the US, when there are vaccines in surplus, why can't you actually go ahead and take it? What will it take away? All these, you know, theories and stuff. And, you know, honestly, I can't question anybody's personal belief. They are your beliefs. They are your religious beliefs. But I wish people would understand what devastation it has caused for others and re-examine their own values as I am examining my own revalues after all this has happened it has made me so much more human and so much more wanting to stay in my people's lives the minute I hear somebody say you know I'm not doing okay I want to call them up and talk to them and not just send them a message because it's wow really empathetic wow well yes I really wanted to have you speak to that a little bit because your message is so strong. Everything you've shared with us has just been so incredible. We got to get back together. Let's move to four to four for four, okay? I do four for four. And I'm gonna ask you in this, 
one question that you'll give me four answers to. And there are four of these questions, one of which you've already alluded a lot to. The first question is, Shuchi, you get to invite anybody you want to dinner, living or dead. Let's exclude the people who passed away for COVID because I know that you could fill this list more than once with them. But outside of COVID deaths, you can invite anyone living or dead to dinner. Who would you invite and why? So, you know, I would probably invite at this present moment, my own parents, first of all, I just so <laughs> I'm dying to hug my mom and dad and, you know, be with them. But How I long has it been? Oh, two years, more than two years now. Um, it's terrible. And um, I would um, love to invite um, actually my husband's dad, who was a very, very great man, but I never got the chance to meet him because he died very um, uh, early and um, uh, very young in his life. And I would also like to, so he's dead, but I would love to invite him. And then the person that I would love to invite, who's not a family member or a friend, but um, somebody who I've admired very much, and probably you won't know him. So only if you have some Indian listenership, they would identify with it. But it's a man called um, um, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who was one of the freedom fighters in India and a leader. And he did not become our prime minister. Jawaharlal Nehru became our prime minister after India got freedom from the British rule. And I feel mm -hmm. India would have been such a different country if he had been around and became the prime minister. And I actually always think of what would he have done in order to, if he had become the prime minister and what future that would have meant for India compared to where we are on the world stage. Because wow. I feel India has missed so many opportunities because you know, people like me are just busy in talking in cocktail parties and never take action. And then our leadership is fairly um, corrupt. And I feel like if somebody like him had taken control after independence, the whole future of India would have been different. So in my head, I've had many, many times I've thought about what my country would have been. Well, you get one more person to invite to dinner, although you've got quite a dinner party already. <laughs> Uh, probably I would, um, you know, I would invite um, some old friend from school, you know, I feel like uh, girlfriends are really important. So I have a friend back home in India, who again, I haven't seen for years, but uh, we've grown up together since very young age. And I feel like, um, you know, she's someone that would probably be very it would be great to have dinner with her and just chat about not only today, but our past and whatever. As I grow old, I'm f I feel much more nostalgic. Well, I pray that she follows me and that she watches this podcast because she will see the love and the joy that you have on your face when you refer to her. And she'll likely know who she is right away. Yes. Okay, let's go two for four. And the reason I had you do another one is because I counted your parents as one, okay, okay. in unity. Um, what four books would you recommend to our family to read and why? Okay, I'm really, really bad uh, with names, but I will recommend a couple of books. And I was actually just reading a book that I was trying to look at the name and I'm, that's why I'm gazing at my books that are lying there. But Go ahead and have a look, pull them down if you need. Uh, okay, then give me a sec because there's one book that I'm reading right now that I think is outstanding. Hang okay, on. yeah, I, I'm really interested in that. And I'm the same as you, Shuji. Sometimes I can be so impressed, so educated, so inspired by a book. And then I'll go, but what's the name of the book? Or sometimes even my favorite authors, I can have that uh, occur. But the fact that you're willing to share these books and these stories that are important to you with our audience, with our family, that's important. So I'm really happy for you to do that. Um, so this is a book that I'm reading, What I Know Now, and it's Letters to My Younger Self. 
And it's letters written by various women to what they would have said, you know, Nora Roberts and, you know, Rebecca Lobo and lots of other people on what mm -hmm. they would have said to their younger self. And I think um, it's an amazing book. Um, you know, I after reading this, I keep thinking about what I would have said to my younger self. Um, the second book that I strongly- Wait, and what would you have said to your younger self? <laughs> Don't be so impatient. Things come. <laughs> okay. And the second book? <laughs> um, the second book that I would um, strongly recommend to people is um, a little bit of a sp spiritual book. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that it informs um, that it informs a lot of uh, philosophies across the world. Um, um, so you do get it in a simplified form. It's called the Gita. It's a really a spiritual book in India, but it is it talks about the power of action and karma. You know, karma is a big thing in India and what you do. And I feel like that is just um, it's a great uh, book to actually um, uh, read and um, and just understand, you know, what actions mean and what does it mean to do certain things and the power of choices and and what it means to do something irrespective of our emotions and, and to me it's very deep philosophy so i won't you know go on until on a friday afternoon but it's a great book the other book that i would recommend is pride and prejudice i'm a big big jane austen fan and ah uh -huh, yes <laughs> And so I would recommend um, Pride and Prejudice. And there are a hundred other books I could that I could recommend because I'm an avid reader, but I'm trying to see which are the um, main books that, um, that have kind of, um, you know, made a huge impact on my life. And the last would probably be The Power of Now from Eckhart Tolle. I think that's mm -hmm. other incredible. Between that and The Secrets, I'm always confused which is the one which is better to read because essentially Eckhart Tolle has written in like a thousand pages what she wrote right. in maybe 200 pages. But yeah. I think both of them talk about, you know, the positivity, the optimism, the thing that you need to do now. But there are a hundred other books that I could recommend to you, but these are four that are just coming to my mind right now. Awesome. And oftentimes the four who come first are the ones that really have a meaning that probably someone's going to benefit from deliberately. I know I'm a Jane Austen fan as well. So I was delighted to have you mention Pride and Prejudice inside of those other books, um, categories. Three for four. You ready to go three for four? What music are you listening to now? Four different musics you're listening to, and why are you listening to these four right now? So I'm very much into a lot of Indian classical, um, sorry, Indian Bollywood music. So yes. I can't say one, but I listen to all kinds of Bollywood music, especially when I'm either very happy or very sad, I have to listen to my own music. So I, that is one category that probably a lot of you, you uh, people may not identify with, but I listen to a lot. Who doesn't also love listen Indian Bollywood music? Who doesn't love it? <laughs> and they do. And then um, I'm actually listening to all kinds of music of my daughters, something called New York, New York, and some rappers and some other people that she listens to, you know, Ariana Grande and this and that, because I'm trying to understand her music. So every time yes. I'm driving with her in the car, it's all her music playing. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the music that I'm listening to is my what my daughter uh, likes, you know, and listens to. Half of them, I can't understand the words. Many, I don't even know the musicians half the times, but some of the music is actually great in spite of my own this thing. And then I recently just revisited a whole phase around uh, Beatles. And I'm sure that that might uh, not be, uh, again, something that your younger viewers know, but I've been having this whole Beatles phase for the last one month. And then- well, You know, they're incredible. I mean, they happen to have been uh, one of my husband's favorite groups, them and the Rolling Stones. You can see my husband's picture behind me. He was British born. Um, and 
I just last night, I think I saw, I don't know if it was Nightline or not, but it was on one of the, it might have been Nightline if that comes on uh, the same channel as the Olympics uh, recap. But Shuchi, I was watching someone, uh, a documentary on the night that John Lennon died. And John Lennon, I loved, who was a Beatle, and he wrote the song Imagine. That's my favorite song of all time. So I am so with you. We are vibing in our reading and our music. This is incredible. Thank you. What else are you listening and, to, girl? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And actually, along with Beatles, I'm also listening to a lot of Joan Baez because she stays in Palo Alto. <laughs> and just recently, I crossed her house and you know, I told my husband, oh, we must listen to her album again. So I've been playing a little bit of that. And you know, I'm heavily into Western classical. So I recently somebody gifted me a whole set of uh, stuff by Mozart, uh, yeah. and that's actually replayed by my niece who went to Juilliard, and she's created this whole uh, you know adaptations from Mozart and um, and um, uh, and a couple of the other classical Bach. And if stuff. she does Chopin, which usually the people who are really heavy into Western classical don't necessarily love Chopin the way I do. Chopin is more in interpreted or enjoyed by, you know, common everyday folk who don't have a high taste. But I love Chopin. If she I does do. any Chopin, please share. I will. I will. She's very gifted. And so I kind of listening to some of that and, and you know, and Bach to break it in the middle. I love his yeah. piano. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Very different kinds of music. But I have to say Bollywood is my all time five favorite music. Oh, girl, I, you know what, when COVID is over, we just got to sit down. I don't care whether it's tea or whatever, but we got to sit down and just enjoy each other or take a walk. I don't care. We got to enjoy each other face to face. This is four for four. And you kind of answered some of it earlier, but I give you leeway to answer with anything more or different that you want to share. I'm going four for four. What are four pieces of all time? all time life advice will you give to our family watching you now listening to you now and why and it can be advice that was shared to you please give homage to the person who did it if you will or it can be advice of your own earning that you would share with us so one advice that i have that i've read everywhere and it's said but I learned it from a book that I read as a kid. It's the book that had the most impact on me when I was maybe seven years old. I read this book, um, you know, where God is talking to his angels and said, get me the most beautiful prayer. And so, you know, the angels are looking for this prayer and they, all the prayers they're seeing are very black and, you know, uh, black and dark and whatever. It's people asking for a big house, a big job, this, that. And then they see this beautiful, luminous prayer and they think, oh, this prayer must be coming from one very rich guy because, you know, it's so beautiful. And then they trace the pair back and it is one little kid under a street lamp who lives on the street and is praying and just thanking God for everything that he has. And he's a little kid under the street. And, you know, he's just happy that he's earned his meal for the day, that somebody gave him an old book to read, and he's thanking God for it. And as a kid, I remember reading this, and it made such a big impact on my life that, and today it's very important, everywhere you leave, they say, you know, the power of gratitude. But I think it's really important that we be grateful for what we have in life. All of us want more, but do not forget to count your blessings because even if you are a, have nothing, there's always something to be grateful for. And I know it's easy for me to say that sitting in Palo Alto, having a job, having a kid and everything else. But every day of my life, I try and find one thing that makes me grateful for something. Um, so that's one, one life advice. The second is, you know, 
um, I think it's really important to laugh. Laugh at yourself, laugh at everything in life. I always make jokes about myself and, you know, whatever and, and stuff and try and create levity in serious situations because I think humor and laughter is the best way to really survive life. And um, that's really important. And um, the third thing is, you know, just, um, and this is more career related to people out there who are looking at their careers, which is never look at a career at a point of time. And this was actually told to me by the same boss who asked me, do you want to come to the USA? He told me, never look at careers at a point of time, because at a point of time, you may be top or bottom. Careers must be looked at as a span. In that span of time, how have you done? In that particular point, you could be high, you could be low, but important to look at career as a span and not just the high or the low as a particular point of time. So mm -hmm. that's another thing which is more professional, which is, you know, look at your career as a span and never at a point. Um, the fourth piece of uh, advice that I would have to people is, you know, um, really value, um, um, you know, your, your friends, your family, um, nature, uh, whatever it is, you know, I don't ask, I, I never, I'm very spiritual, but I don't tell people, oh, you need to believe in God. I think all of us need to believe in something because it keeps us grounded. It makes us better people. But if we value whatever it is that we value and our friends and family, I think we are set up for a lot of happiness in life. Wow. Oh, okay. So look, I have so enjoyed this visit. So I don't want to say goodbye. Shoot, let's not say we're going to say goodbye. Let's just say from my house to your home, heartfelt thanks, and we'll join again soon. How's that? Absolutely. We will join again too. And it was absolutely awesome talking to you and thank you so much for all your kindness and saying such nice things about me and um, it's been a real pleasure and I do hope we can do the tea or the walk sometime mm. wow 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 thank you, thank you.